Good morning, dear participants. Um, a warm welcome from my side to all of you attending this webinar. And I'm very glad to see that so many of you have registered for this meeting, uh, which is on what we think is an important topic. As you may know, this webinar series is inspired by the iconic UCAMS periodic table that was created in the International Year of the Periodic Table some time ago, and which focuses on the scarcity of the elements. Scarcity is not a static thing. The world is changing, the economy is changing, our needs are changing, and at the same time, we need to realize a more sustainable situation um, with, um, among all of us. And this transition to a sustainable situation is not going by itself. And in order to keep drawing attention to this theme of scarcity, UCAMS has launched this webinar series. In fact, um, this is only the second webinar. Um, we had a su very successful one on, on carbon um, that uh, David Cole Hel Hamilton will talk later about. But um, uh, there are several, there definitely will be more to, uh, to follow in the near future. The idea of these webinars is that we provide relevant information on various aspects of a certain element to show a complete picture of the situation of this element and have discussion on current developments and what may have to be changed in the near future. We are very glad to have eminent speakers today, including representatives of the European Parliament and the European Commission, and also experts on the various different topics ranging from resource and geopolitical issues of lithium to its different applications, um, such as uh, in lithium ion batteries, and also the replacement of lithium and recycling of lithium. With this diverse range of, of topics, I think this is a, a very interesting program, and I'm actually very much looking forward to all the lectures. I wish you all a fruitful and enjoyable day with good discussions. And I now would like to give the floor to uh, Professor uh, Nicola Armarola, Armaroli, who is the chair of today and will um, guide you all through this, through this program. And uh, we'll also give some, some technical uh, information. Uh, Nicola, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Floris, Mr. President. My name is Nicola Armaroli and I'm Research Director at the Italian National Research Council, CNR in Bologna, Italy. And I have the honor to chair this UCAMS event on lithium. First of all, I wish to thank our distinguished speakers, also on behalf of the whole UCAMS Executive Board, for having accepted our invitation and give their valuable contribution to our workshop uh, today. With this second webinar, UCAMS continues its effort to raise society's awareness on the limited mineral resources of our planet which are epitomized by our flagship periodic table highlighting element abundance and scarcity, which are uh, fluctuating concepts as uh, already pointed out by, by Floris. A few weeks ago, we have issued the updated version of our table after an intensive scientific discussion that was started after our April webinar on carbon. We will have the chance to highlight this later on. I wish to thank the people whose dedication and enthusiasm has made this, this event possible, namely uh, the colleagues of the Executive Board Task Force on the Periodic Table, Christophe Copere, uh, Rinaldo Poli, and Floris Ruggis, along with the external members, David Cole Hamilton and Alessandra Quadrelli. My special thanks go also to the staff at the Secretariat at UCAMS, particularly the Secretary General Nineta Rastelli, along with uh, Laura Jose and uh, Anna Robinson. During uh, our event today, we will launch two online polls, uh, one in the morning during uh, the, the, the break and also the, the, the lunch, and the other one in the afternoon. So I ask all the attendees to, to participate and vote because this is important for future developments of our initiatives. Now it's time for a few technical recommendations, both for attendees and speakers. Please, Laura, uh, show, show the slide. Thank you. 
for the attendees, please send your questions in the Q&A box uh, below your screen. Our speakers will answer them as many as possible during the panel discussion, so at the end of every uh, half-day session. Please do not copy or photograph information displayed during the webinar. If you have any technical issues, please uh, message the administrator via the chat box. Of course, we want to highlight that we do not tolerate harassment or of conference participants in any forum. The audio and video recording of lectures by any means, by photography or slide or poster material and printed or electronic quotes from papers, presentations and discussion at the conference without explicit consent of the contributing member is prohibited. We will record our, our uh, webinar and it will be made available to everybody online in, in a few days. And... Uh, this is, uh, well, for technical help, uh, I uh, ask you attendees to refer to the chat uh, box on, on your screen for technical help and not for questions to speakers because for the questions, you have to go to the Q&A box. So please click there and make your questions. Now, uh, let's go with the morning session. I'm going to start it with a three minute short introduction. And my idea here is framing lithium within my own personal experience, particularly as an electric driver. Uh, and then I will leave the stage to the speakers one by one. So let me uh, share uh, uh, the screen. Here it is. Okay. Um, I want to introduce this topic of today with a practical uh, experience of myself. Uh, recently, I, I drove with my, with my electric car from Bologna, where I live, to Trieste at the border with Slovenia. It is a 300 kilometer motorway trip uh, with a battery electric vehicle. All of it is uh, by motorway, so the speed is high, like uh, 130 kilometers per hour. And uh, what uh, the amount of energy that I consume is 51 kilowatt hour for doing 300 kilometers. So this corresponds 51 kilowatt hours to 5.7 liters of petrol. So in a way, I may say that I have a 53 kilometer per liter car. So it's it's this shows that you consume a lot of uh, much less energy using uh, using an electric car compared to an equivalent petrol car. So I went to, you know, there are uh, online, uh, online uh, uh, websites that tells you how much uh, um, uh, gasoline you consume for your trip, how much do you spend and so on and so forth. In, if I had a car with the same power, the same features, I would have consumed for the same trip at the same speed, 45 liters of oil, of, of, of petrol, which is about eight times as much. Probably this is an ideal situation because it was not a very low temperature and so on, but anyhow, by using an electric car, you consume at least four times less energy to drive the same kilometers. So this means it goes in the right direction of the energy transition. And if we extend this on a national scale, I made this uh, simple assumption of uh, considering only Italy, and uh, uh, assuming that by 2030 or 35, we have in this country 35% battery or plug-in hybrid uh, altogether, okay? And if this would be true, you would have to produce 30 terawatt hour of electricity to drive these cars, but we would uh, save a lot of oil, uh, much more oil, more than four times oil for not using it petrol uh, conventional cars. So this goes exactly in the direction of saving energy. So this is exactly the title of our, of our, um, of our uh, webinar today, because we go and, and show that uh, we, we go in the right direction of the energy transition, which, is, which means saving energy. When you say electric cars, uh, uh, it's, it's not a, a, a unique uh, technology because the cathode technology diversifies. Uh, I put here two cars, one of a colleague of mine with a 50 kilowatt hour uh, and, and ni uh, nickel um, manganese cobalt battery and my own car, which is uh, lithium iron phosphate. And this is interesting for chemists because if you look at the 
composition of the of, of the of the battery, uh, particularly to the anode and cathode materials, but also for the electric connection and so on. You see that in this car here, in the in the, in the two cars, you still have uh, of course lithium. This doesn't change. This one sticks. But uh, in the first car, you have uh, a lot of cobalt, nickel, and manganese, which you don't have in the second one. Whereas in the second one, you have a lot of iron, which is not uh, such a big concern for availability. So this is to say that depending on the evolution of the technology, we will have consequences on our periodic table uh, in the future. So uh, this is what we are going to, to discuss this morning, and we will see uh, how we can manage this lithium that we cannot change for, for some time for sure, and how this uh, element is important for our future development of the energy transition. So that's it uh, from me. And uh, now we, uh, as an introduction, now we move to the first speaker. And the first speaker is uh, uh, a member of the uh, um, European Parliament. And uh, it is my honor to introduce uh, Simona Bonafè, which will contribute with, with a video recorded because uh, these are very busy days at the European Parliament, but she was kind enough to send us a nice video that I will, we will show you in, in, in a few seconds. Simona Bonafè ran for her second uh, uh, mandate as a member of the European Parliament in May 2019. In this institution, she is the Vice President of the Progressive Alliance of Socialists and Democrats, in charge of parliamentary affairs and inter-institutional relations. She sits as member in the Committee for Environment, Public Health and Food Safety, uh, MV, and a substitute member in the Committee on Industry, Research and Energy, ITRE. She is co-chair and co-founder of the Parliamentary Intergroup Sustainable Long-Term Investment and Competitive European Industry. She was the European Parliament Rapporteur for the revision of the four directives contained in the Circular Economy Package and for the Water Reuse Regulation. And she is currently, that's very important for us today, the Rapporteur for the Sustainable Battery Regulation. Before the European Parliament, uh, uh, Simona Bonafè was elected to the Italian Lower Chamber in 2013, sitting in the Committee for Economic Activities and Trade. So now I ask the, uh, the technical staff to launch the video of uh, Simona Bonafè. Thank you. Good morning to everyone. First, uh, let me thank you, uh, CAMS, for inviting me to take the floor at this event uh, organized by the EU CAMS Periodic Table Task Group, uh, chaired by Nicola Armaroli, that I want to thank uh, for introducing me to this timely and fascinating project. Uh, your focus on the relative abundance uh, of strategic chemical elements uh, uh, is fully in line with the commitment of the European Parliament uh, and mine personally uh, to the transition to a circular economy and an efficient use of resources. Uh, we need to raise society's awareness uh, of the limited mineral resources and raw materials available on Earth. This is key both to limit our pressure on the planet and to ensure the environmental and economic sustainability of our economic model. In the past mandate, uh, I have been the European Parliament Rapporteur for the revision of the four waste directives, uh, the so-called uh, Circular Economy Package. Uh, there, we managed to update the European legislation with binding and ambitious targets for recycling in a gradual shift away from landfilling. Uh, although at the time uh, we were able to insert a wording on the prevention of waste uh, through eco-design and on the strategic importance of the uptake of secondary raw materials, uh, the focus was still mainly on the end of life of products. It is in this new mandate uh, that these references to prevention and design are finally uh, starting to enter EU law. The new action plan on circular economy approved by the European Commission in March 2020 as one of the main building blocks of the Green Deal announced initiatives along the entire life cycle of products, uh, target, targeting in particular uh, how these are designed. 
Uh, today in the European Parliament uh, with the new sustainable batteries uh, regulation where I am rapporteur for DEP, uh, we are working to lay down for the first time a holistic set of rules uh, to govern an entire product life cycle uh, from the design phase to end uh, of life. The regulation will ensure that greater amounts of precious metals are recovered through battery recycling. This approach is essential for the shift to a circular economy and to contribute to tackling the scarcity of critical raw materials such as lithium that today's discussion will address. Today, the supply of many critical raw materials is highly concentrated outside the EU. It is therefore important to manage the transition to electrification while decreasing our dependence on the imported lithium and in general our demand of virgin raw materials. A process that requires innovation, new technologies, uh, the minimization of resource consumption and the maintenance and reuse of valuable raw materials within the EU. Given all this, the European Parliament uh, work on the new sustainable batteries regulation aims at introducing new standards to make batteries produced and sold in Europe the greenest in the world. The data reported in the Commission's impact assessment support the need to define specific sustainable criteria for batteries. At present, the potential of batteries of battery recycling within the EU uh, remains uh, untapped and therefore only a small part of materials used in battery manufacturing are secondary materials. For this reason, in my draft report, I propose to raise the lithium recovery target to 70% in 2025 and 90% in 2030. Uh, this new regulation can lay down harmonized rule setting sustainability standards to promote end-to-end -end battery production in the so-called gigafactories. These new standards could become a benchmark for the entire global battery market and should apply to all types of battery sold in the European market, uh, including those imported from non-EU uh, countries. I'm fully aware of the complexity and dynamic nature of the energy transition and resource efficient, uh, efficiency topic. I believe that the relevant legislation will need to evolve in step with scientific knowledge and technological developments. It is also for this reason that I have been particularly happy to share with you uh, my consideration and I look forward to hearing the different valuable contributions that will be expressed by the upcoming speakers. Um, I wish you a fruitful discussion and look forward to further occasion uh, to work together. Thank you. This is very good news, I think, that uh, Simona Bonafé gave us because uh, nowadays lithium is not recycled in, in batteries and batteries nowadays means particularly electronic appliances, not cars, because there are still, there are already not uh, new uh, batteries from coming from cars because they are too new. The, the, the first electric cars were um, marketed in Europe some 10 years ago and they are still very few. So we don't have big amounts of batteries, but we are ready for the next few years, within the next decade, to have the right legislation in place because we need, as she said, to recover from 70 to 90% of lithium by the end of the decade. And that will be crucial to, to run a real circular economy on our, uh, on our battery system in Europe because we don't have so many resources. That's, that's very excellent news. Um, now we can move uh, to uh, the second speaker. And the second speaker is uh, uh, Professor David Cole Hamilton, who, uh, following degrees at the Edinburgh University, worked with Nobel laureate Sir Geoffrey Wilkinson at Imperial College in, uh, in London on organometallic chemistry and especially homogeneous catalysis. He started his independent career at the University of Liverpool and then moved back to Scotland as professor of chemistry at the University of St. Andrews in 1985. 
where he became emeritus in 2014. David is a past president of the European Chemical Society, having been president from 2013 to 17. This gave him extensive contact with chemical society and policymakers uh, across Europe. On behalf of UCAMS, he led the task group celebrating the International Year of the Periodic Table, uh, which developed a new version of the periodic table highlighting element availability and vulnerability, as well as which elements can come from conflict minerals, another hot topic, and which appear in smartphones. I take this opportunity to thank uh, David so much for his hard and very, very successful work on the periodic table, along with all the, the team at UCAMS. Please, David, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nicola. And thank you very much to everybody in the organizing committee for inviting me to speak this morning. Uh, I apologize if this box here is a little box saying enter your search item. I can't get rid of it. I apologize for that. So this morning, I'm going to talk a little bit about the periodic table that Nicola has just mentioned, which is here. Uh, um, and uh, many of you will have seen this, but perhaps not everybody. And uh, what I thought I would do is just very briefly explain what it is. We developed it for the International Year of the Periodic Table in 2019. And it has a number of very, very important messages. The first one is this one at the top, the title, the 90 natural elements that make up everything. And I do mean everything. So everything in this whole beautiful, diverse world is made up from these 90 naturally occurring elements. They're the 90 building blocks of nature. And if we don't look after them, we won't have the same beauty and diversity that we have in the world at the moment. Each of the elements here is uh, represented, the area of it is represents the amount of it in the Earth's crust and in the atmosphere. So this means there's much more oxygen than there is ytterbium, for example. Uh, and this is actually on a log logarithmic scale or you wouldn't see the ones down here. Then the elements are color coded. Uh, red ones mean that if we continue using them the way we do, where we use them, disperse them so, so we use a phone we stick it in a drawer or something that element is lost to society we call that dispersing and for the ones that are red there's a serious threat in the next hundred years for the orange one there's an increasing threat from rising use yellow limited availability a future risk to supply green there's plenty of it and then you'll see there are four elements tantalum tungsten gold and tin which are partially shaded gray <clears throat> and this is because they can come from areas where wars are fought over the mines, where they come from, or the proceeds of the mine are used to fund wars. These are called conflict minerals. Uh, they come from other places, and at the moment we try to use them from other places. Uh, but if you don't, if you take them from, it's largely the Democratic Republic of the Congo, then you have something perhaps in your pocket which people have died to produce. And then you'll see 31 of the elements have this phone symbol, smartphone symbol on them. These are the 31 symbols in most smartphones. This is available in 30, over 30 languages from the website here. Now, as Nicola mentioned, we had a meeting about carbon uh, very recently because of a letter that we had from Alessandra Quadrelli, who's a, a member of the task group that's working on the periodic table. And she suggested with a group of 40 other scientists that maybe carbon, sorry, let's just look at carbon here. Carbon is green in this original periodic table. Maybe it should be uh, orange because there is a worry about the use of carbon, both in terms of its, uh, res the resource availability, as we'll see in a minute, but also because of global warming. And in addition, they suggested that it might be changed to black because it's a conflict mineral. So let's just have a look at what, what we were thinking about there. So the question is, why is carbon green in the periodic table? Well, the main uses of carbon in nature are in photosynthesis. Carbon dioxide is taken up by photosynthesis by plants. And then respiration of the plants at night or of, of animals. Uh, that, so photosynthesis is this reaction making glucose from uh, glucose and oxygen from carbon dioxide and water. 
uh, and respiration is the reverse reaction. And this is totally imbalanced under normal circumstances, and that's called homeostasis. The carbon dioxide is recycled uh, by these two processes. It's also available in very large amounts in limestone, glyphs and so on, it's 4% of the Earth's crust. So there's plenty of carbon dioxide, uh, so plenty of carbon in the world, and so we felt it was abundant and naturally recycled. But should it be green? That's the question. Is green really the appropriate color for carbon? There's a lot of deforestation going on at the moment, and um, very happily in the COP26 summit, large numbers of countries agreed to try to reduce deforestation and stop it by 2030. We burn a lot of fossil fuels and that put, puts carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. This means by taking forests away, we remove less carbon dioxide. By putting fossil fuels into the atmosphere, we have more carbon dioxide. And this is uh, homeostasis breaks down and then we come to global warming. And this shows here uh, very recent um, changes in the level of the temperature and of the carbon dioxide. And you'll see here that suddenly the carbon dioxide goes up. This is as we enter the industrial revolution, we burn fossil fuels and then the temperature rises afterwards. And this is the evidence that the um, global warming is caused by the carbon dioxide. In addition, when we come to, so that means that there's going to be a serious threat or there is a serious threat now. So this is a serious threat in the next 100 years. So maybe carbon should be red. And if we look at the lifetimes of the various different types of carbon source in years, there's oil, gas, and coal, You'll see that both oil and gas, this is BP data from their statistical review every year, is about 50 years for both oil and gas, a bit longer for coal. So there's a serious threat to the supply if we carry on using it in the way we do at the moment. This is the readily available oil. There is more than that, of course. So there is a serious threat now, so maybe carbon should be red. Uh, should carbon be gray, meaning it comes from conflict minerals? Well, Earthwork says that conflict minerals are resources mined uh, where, in fact, there are problems with the mining to do with wars, either in terms of the ownership of the mines or in terms of the proceeds of the mines. Well, clearly there have been wars, the invasion of Kuwait in 1990, the attack on Saudi Arabian oil fields in 2019, the troubles in the real problems in Yemen at the moment, where the attacks are funded by oil revenues these are all clearly areas where carbon is a conflict mineral. And ISIS was largely funded through oil revenues it got from taking oil fields in Syria and Iraq. Uh, luckily, they've been taken back. And uh, even Wikipedia suggests that oil might be a conflict resource. So as a result of this discussion, which was held as a result of Alessandra's letter, UKIMS decided to change the periodic table. And indeed it changed it so that carbon now <coughs> has, uh, is red, it's green because there isn't masses of it in the uh, CO2 cycle. It's red because of the threats that I've described already. And it's gray because it's now a conflict resource. Now, this was a change that the, periodic, the task group made. But in addition to that change, which is that one there, we also changed the um, definition where it said from conflict minerals before, it now says from conflict resources, did that? Sorry, what's happened there? Oh, yes, right, from conflict resources, because of course, oil and uh, gas are not minerals. We've also added to the title here. So before it said, how much is there? That's the area. Is that enough? That's the color. But now we're saying, is it sustainable? We really have to think about the sustainability of these elements. As I said earlier, if we don't have them, we can't have the diversity of the planet. So that's the result of the discussions we had in the task group concerning the periodic table. I now want to go on and talk about lithium, which is really what we're talking about today. Lithium is, uh, sorry, lithium is a, a very important element. Uh, it's, an, it's a metal which has, um, I hope this is going to run, sorry, yeah, it's a, it's a shiny metal, it's very light, and it's, you see the silvery metal there, it's quite soft, 
But if you put it into water, it's very reactive. It reacts with water to give hydrogen. And you can see it giving hydrogen here. That's what the bubbles are. It produces lithium hydroxide. And you can see it's light because it's floating on the water. Now, what we're really concerned with here is lithium batteries, although it has many other uses, as we'll hear during the day and we'll see here. This is a lithium battery, and these slides came from Nicola Amaroli, our chairman, thank you to him. Uh, and basically it has a carbon cathode, a lithium electrode, and a lithium, sorry, a carbon anode, a lithium electrode, and a, and a lithium, sometimes with cobalt cathode, but he's already described his car, which doesn't have cobalt in it. And the reason that lithium is used in these batteries, it's very light and very small, and it's the smallest metal in the light, and which has a very high electrochemical potential. You want it to be light because you don't want to carry great lumps of stuff around which are heavy. It has a high energy density, it has a high charging speed, it lasts for a long time and you can recharge it many times, uh, and that makes it perfect for batteries. Now, what about the supply and demand for, oh, sorry, I should say here in the cathode, there can be cobalt and other metals. Uh, cobalt is a real problem, but as Nicola's already said, they're phasing it out of the, the cathode here, and we're not talking about cobalt today, but we could talk about it in another one of these seminars. So lithium demand and supply. The demand in terms of cars, there are 80 million cars supplied worldwide every year. And if we have them all electric, then lithium, we, if they all went over to electric tomorrow, we'd have to have 800,000 tons of lithium a year. World production at the moment is about 80,000 tons. And you see there's a, a discontinuity. So we would have to mine more. It's also used in lots of other things. And we're going to hear about a lot of these things today. What about the supply side? Well, the major resources are in Australia and China. The reserves are 16 million tons. Now I'm going to come back to these numbers, so we needn't look at them too much. The reserves mean the readily available ones that we can get at, but the resources, the total amount in the planet, is about 53 million tons. And the largest resource is this in Sala de Unia, uh, on the border between Bolivia and Peru, and it's a salt lake, and it has a large amount of lithium in it. And it's 10,000 square kilometres. And just as a comparison, since UKEMS is in Belgium, Belgium is 30,000 square kilometers. So it's a very, very large lake. Now, we have to be very careful though when we try to mine lithium. There's lithium in many places. And for example, in the Salé, I can't pronounce it, you, 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 you know, um, there are flamingos and we must make sure we don't disturb their habitats when we try to mine the, the uh, lithium from there. The main, the largest deposits in Europe are in Portugal. And in fact, here's a, a valley where they were going to take a lot of lithium out of here. And this, is a, this project has been abandoned because of the environmental consequences. So we have to think about the ecology and the environment when we're doing this. So now what we're talking about here is what color should lithium be? And we have it yellow here. And it's yellow in the periodic table because the data that we took to make the periodic table was from 2011. In 2011, there were the reserves was thought to be 13 million tons. There's a bit more now. And the usage per year was 34,000 tons, which gave a lifetime in years of 382 years. So there wasn't really a major problem, but there was a concern that there might be limited available availability through future use. There we are. We now come fast forward to 2020. The reserves now seem to be a bit more than that, about 16 million. The usage is about 80,000. And this means that there's only about 20, uh, usage per hour, per year, I beg your pardon. Uh, that, uh, and, sorry, and so that means that there'll be 200 years supply. So we're getting an increase in the risk. So perhaps we should change the color to orange now. But then when we think about what's going to happen next, uh, if all the cars were to be electric, I've told you the reserves would be 16 million. The usage would be 0.8 million tons. And that means the lifetime is only 20 years. So maybe lithium should be red, as I've shown you here. The question is, what do we do? So, but 
in order to, if, if we want to carry on having electric cars, we really must recycle the lithium. We've heard about recycling so far. Everybody who's spoken has mentioned recycling. And we have a lecture from Paul Anderson about that later on. Let's look at what's happening in recycling. Well, this is a, a, a color this again with 2011 data. And you'll see that lithium here is virtually unrecycled, less than 1% of recycling. In 2021, we'll hear more about this from Paul. Uh, it's probably about 5%. And we've heard from Simone Bonafé that by 2025, in four years time, that's got to go to 70%. And by 2030, it's got to go to 90%. So there's an enormous challenge there in terms of recycling. Uh, will it grow fast enough? Uh, if so, could we go back to orange here? Or maybe we'll to be so successful and get to that 90% that uh, Simone Bonafé was saying. And then, of course, we'll have enough lithium for the foreseeable future. So my question to you is, what color should lithium be? And we're going to ask you that question specifically soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David, for your, uh, for your uh, presentation and your talk. And it is clear that lithium is something that we have to think about. And you, you, you really raised the point very, very clearly. So the discussion next uh, about the color of, of, of lithium for you can should be very hot, I think, as it was for, for carbon. That's, that's very good. So for questions to David, uh, please, uh, uh, I, I invite the attendees to start making questions in, in, the, in, the, in the box that will be uh, answered later on during the, um, uh, the panel session. Now we move to the next speaker, and the next speaker is going to talk about uh, uh, lithium reserves, resources, and geopolitical issues. So we, we go deeper into, into the topic, which is clearly uh, very important. Our next speaker is Fernando Rocha, who obtained uh, his degree in geology from the University of Lisbon in 1984, and his PhD in geosciences from the University of Aveiro, Portugal in 1994. After a brief passage by the private sector as engineering geologist on public works, he has developed his academic career at the University of Aveiro, Portugal, since 1986, in the fields of mineral resources, marine and coastal geology, as well as medical and environmental geology. In these fields, he has published nearly 250 papers. Since 2002, he has been full professor in Aveiro at the Department of Mineral Resources, Geosciences, and serves as director of the Geobiotech Research Center since 2007. He held several positions at the University of Aveiro, including head of the Department of Geosciences for several years, pro-rector for infrastructures, and vice-rector for research, innovation, and technology transfer. Please, uh, Fernando, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nicole. First of all, I want to uh, uh, thank the invitation to be here in this very interesting uh, uh, event. Uh, I will talk uh, just a little bit on, on the geological issues of lithium uh, uh, exploration and exploitation, uh, and it's a, a pleasure to do it after the, my, the intervention of my previous colleague, because it, it's, they are very closely connected. I can uh, even start saying that, from my point of view, lithium is a yellow element. Okay, but it is, it is just just my personal point of view. And now I will share my with you my my presentation. Good, we can see it. Bye. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, the major problem we are facing now concerning not only lithium, but uh, almost all uh, mineral raw materials is uh, the fact that uh, since the 60s, the uh, European Union countries uh, are closing almost all national uh, mining uh, uh, activities. Uh, so, 
At the moment, uh, uh, Europe uh, mineral raw material supply is depending almost completely on third world. Uh, and some of the major uh, third world mining suppliers are not politically stable. And this has put some uh, consequences uh, uh, on public opinion regarding mining activity that is considered major as a, a, a criminal, almost criminal activity, not only by uh, the people in general, but also by opinion makers, putting a, a, a political difficulty to open or even reopening uh, uh, former mines, as I will show you later on. But uh, as most of you know, and these pandemic moments gave us a, a, a good uh, online uh, example. Some suppliers, like for instance Brazil and China, are becoming consumers and reducing the export of these mineral raw materials. Even some very basic and common, like, for instance, copper. So Europe is facing a, a increased stress on mineral raw material supply, not just at this moment, but since at least the beginning of the century. So in some countries like Portugal, we are already reopening mines. Uh, uh, I just give you two uh, uh, examples, very recent ones. Uh, the first is on the bottom, is concerning a, a copper and zinc uh, mine uh, called Aljustrel, located in the south of the country on the very famous Iberian pyrite bell. This mine is a very old one and uh, was closed uh, 10 years before, but is now reopening uh, uh, and increasing to uh, annual production uh, to produce copper and zinc. And in the north of the country, we are uh, 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 projecting to reopen the uh, former Moncorvo iron uh, mine. Uh, uh, last year, uh, production was resumed, but just focused on the uh, uh, mining waste piles. So we are uh, doing a sort of remining the uh, iron mine waste in this uh, former Monkov, Monkov, uh, uh, iron mine. But uh, as I will show you uh, uh, on the former part of this presentation, most of our uh, projected lithium mines are actually former mining uh, uh, activities closed some of them since the 60s, and others are uh, on uh, exploitation, but not for lithium, uh, actually for feldspars for ceramics. So no true new mines are putting on the table in Portugal. And why? Because uh, uh, the recent developments in global markets are forcing uh, uh, European countries to change the vision regarding mineral raw materials. Uh, concerning the European Union, this is not uh, uh, truly new. Uh, the uh, European Un Union put forward new programs on mineral raw materials on 2012. Uh, a good example is the Eramin uh, uh, program that was focused on mineral resources. Uh, in this slide, uh, you, can, you can see the uh, evolution, the timetable evolution of the elements needed to uh, assure energy production and the number of elements are uh, increasing a lot in this last century. Uh, I will not put uh, a lot of, of time on this table. Uh, some of my colleagues are much better uh, for that. But I, I stress 
this uh, uh, situation at the beginning of the present uh, century, the, the number of uh, uh, elements are not only increasing, but also the scarcity of the elements. Uh, uh, when we look uh, uh, to the left part of this uh, picture, we uh, uh, see just common uh, elements relatively abundant on the so-called lithosphere, the surface of the Earth. But when we look to the uh, uh, right part of the table, we can uh, see very, very scarce uh, elements on, on lithosphere. Here the same, uh, following uh, uh, the idea of using uh, the uh, uh, timetable, the number of elements just on these uh, last decades, from the 80s to the beginning of our century, the number of elements uh, are increasingly uh, being needed to uh, assure the uh, state of life that we are used to assess. And this can be also seen using a, a, an index, the supply risk uh, versus the economic importance. And concerning only our, our focus uh, today, uh, lithium is present in this, in this table, and we need to assure, uh, as my colleague uh, said before, uh, if you have uh, enough supply of lithium. Uh, this, uh, in this table, lithium is not so bad, but uh, with increased consumption, uh, uh, I'm sure that lithium that is here uh, uh, at the bottom will go up and height. So uh, uh, the problem is, uh, is demanding uh, urgent decisions concerning primary or secondary supply of lithium. Just to give an idea of the needs of lithium and its economic and technological relevance, uh, I present you here a, a already classic example of the uh, uh, mineral raw materials we have on a, a normal uh, smartphone. Uh, you have here from from the display to the battery, the demands of minerals that uh, are needed to produce a smartphone. And public opinion is not enough uh, uh, informed about these issues. Uh, it's quite common to see on, on the news uh, uh, people protesting uh, on the possible reopening or opening of, of a mining but taking pictures and making record of the, the protest using a smartphone. Uh, the same could be said about the uh, use of an electric uh, driven car. So we cannot uh, move forward uh, on these uh, new uh, products, more uh, environment friend, without the uh, uh, guarantee of mineral raw material supply. Uh, uh, this picture so show you to, uh, more or less the same information, but showing uh, already the location uh, uh, of the major world uh, producers of these primary raw materials. Uh, uh, my previous colleague show you some of, of, of this information, but concerning lithium, the major producers can be already seen here as Chile, uh, Australia, and China. Uh, uh, all uh, on outside Europe and demanding not only uh, good uh, uh, geopolitical uh, conditions, but also, as these pandemic times reveal, good logistical uh, uh, supply chains. And this is also another uh, geopolitical issue that must be took into consideration, because, uh, uh, for instance, lithium from mineral 
to metal, he is uh, like a, 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 a rich tourist uh, visiting several countries since the opening of the mine till the production of the battery. To have an idea how we uh, uh, can have a, a first idea about this uh, supply risk versus vulnerability or economic importance, uh, we have here four main uh, uh, ranges and the critical materials in which lithium can be or must be included are those showing a high vulnerability and high supply risk, not only related with the abundance versus scarcity on lithosphere, but also the fact that they are only produced on countries or regions uh, politically or socially unstable and also demanding a very long and complex supply chain. And uh, I stress lithium is uh, uh, without any uh, discussion on these uh, uh, critical materials uh, uh, area. So, uh, uh, as previously stressed, we need to look for the sustainable uh, 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 supply of lithium. And for this, uh, uh, I look back exactly to the one of the first uh, European Union uh, uh, programs focused on uh, mineral raw materials that was Adamin uh, Action Mines. Uh, and uh, four points were very, very important in what concerns research and exploitation of geological resources. A sustainable exploitation, meaning that everything that is capable to obtain from a mine must, must be extracted. In this way, we not only guarantee a, a higher amount of mineral materials extracted from the mine, but also we reduce close to zero the amount of mining wastes uh, uh, that are uh, usually the worst consequence and heritage of a, a mining exploitation. Second, remining. For instance, as I told you before in our example of Moncorvo iron mining, uh, 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 the remining of former uh, uh, mining waste piles uh, uh, that at that former moment were not uh, valuable, but now with the increasing demand and the uh, uh, increasing value of the uh, uh, raw materials, it's possible, even from an economic point of view, to go back to this mining weight and use it as a primary raw material. And now, concerning mainly secondary uh, uh, raw materials, uh, to reuse and to recycle, uh, close to the concept of urban mining. Uh, when we look uh, at the sustainable development goals uh, that uh, almost of you are familiar to, uh, some of them are very, very uh, uh, closely related with the uh, geological resources, to the uh, sustainable supply of uh, uh, mineral raw materials. In particular, uh, from my point of view, number 12, responsible consumption and production. Uh, uh, of course, also other uh, ones like industry, innovation, and infrastructure. But uh, uh, I'm particularly uh, uh, focused on number 12, and uh, uh, it will be uh, the main factor of our uh, next uh, slides. In this, in this picture, we can also uh, check the uh, contribution of geological sciences to the uh, different uh, sustainable development goals. And in the case I stressed before, number 12, 
we have here several possible contributions on fields of energy, uh, geo-heritage and geotourism. It's, it's not our goal today, but it's uh, also a very interesting issue. The hydrogeology and uh, contamination, and of course, our, our main goal, the minerals and uh, uh, rock mineral materials supply. So, uh, uh, geology uh, uh, is not only uh, the bad guy of the common public opinion, but can be a, a very relevant uh, uh, actor for the next decades uh, when we are speaking about uh, lit lithium and, of course, energy transition. So, uh, uh, reaching the, the, the paramount uh, point of, of this speech, uh, lithium uh, is uh, actually uh, the potential energy for the next future. This is not a, a personal statement, it's, it's a, a common one. Uh, uh, the main uh, suppliers, as I, I show you before, are these uh, particular countries. Uh, uh, of course, in, in this picture that is from the United States Geological Survey, Portugal is here, but Portugal is not yet producing, producing lithium, lithium uh, as mineral. What we are exporting now, and sometimes it appears on statistics that Portugal is production lithium. This is not actually true. What we are producing is Feldspars for uh, ceramics industry having uh, 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 contaminant minerals with lithium, and this fact uh, uh, this fact is positive because the presence of these uh, uh, contaminant minerals uh, with lithium uh, uh, increase the capacity of these feldspars as ceramic fluxes. But it's clear to see here that uh, child, uh, uh, and China are the major uh, countries with uh, huge reserves of, of the uh, lithium element. In, in this picture, uh, the main point is to uh, uh, show the differences between the uh, principal uh, uh, origins of uh, lithium mines. We have mainly two uh, 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 brines, and uh, uh, what is here called minerals actually it should be uh, hard rock uh, uh, minerals, uh, because a brine it, it can also be considered as a, a mineral. Uh, at the moment, brines are the most important ones because it's easier to e exploit easy and cheaper. Uh, the amounts are also, in general, huge. Uh, uh, geographically, they are located on, on underpopulated uh, uh, zones, so no huge problems with uh, local uh, uh, inhabitants, like, for instance, in, in our uh, national case, as I will show you after. But uh, uh, as my previous colleague already talk uh, uh, in very near future we need to increasingly move from brines to hard rock uh, uh, minerals exploitation generally related with a, a type of geological uh, uh, lithology or type of rock called pegmatites and uh, uh, in our country uh, happily or, or not it depends on the point of view you, we have uh, 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 very uh, uh, abundant and uh, uh, well uh, uh, positioned uh, pegmatites. It's more or less the same. I will go up. So, in, in the case of our European uh, uh, continent, you can see uh, uh, looking to the red dots the geographically distribution of pegmatites containing uh, rare elements. Uh, and in these rare elements, we also include the lithium. 
and uh, it's not only in Portugal, but uh, they are located in a minority of uh, European countries. So some of our countries are richer in, in this type of geological uh, occurrences uh, uh, than others. And Portugal, in this case, uh, of course, also the north of Spain and uh, south uh, uh, west of, of Spain, but in, in Portugal is mainly in the center and the north of the country. Uh, my my uh, university and city is located here by, by the coast, so we are uh, in a good geographical position and we have studied these pegmatites for ceramic industry uh, uh, not thinking uh, till 10 years ago on, on, on lithium as uh, 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 the main uh, uh, economical interesting element. Uh, uh, I remember when I started my, my career 40 years ago, uh, these lithium bearing uh, minerals were considered as uh, uh, contaminant, as negative, uh, it's a good example for, for my students that uh, something that is bad can turn on very good and probably in uh, 50 years go back to something that values zero. This is typical of, of mineral resources, this uh, volatility of, of uh, economic value. And in this picture, uh, you can see a more detailed uh, uh, representation of uh, lithium uh, bearing uh, uh, deposits in, in Portugal and Spain. And uh, the frontier is more or less here. Portugal uh, is, uh, sorry, I go back. Portugal is divided in north, center, and south. And all resources, uh, all lithium resources, as I told you before, are located in the north, in the center and north, but in particular in the north, because uh, it is in this region of Portugal that we have a lot of granitic rocks and pegmatites are generally related with these granitic rocks. A uh, major part of these deposits are or were exploited uh, for industrial minerals and rocks, uh, for ceramics, for glass, uh, for electronics. And now with the increasing demand of lithium, they are uh, uh, thinking of moving to the lithium production. In this map, uh, uh, you can see to uh, uh, possible exploitations that are at the moment being uh, uh, under decision, political decision. The uh, main point of this moment is to prove uh, the environmental uh, uh, issues of the different uh, exploitations. The most advanced are these ones on, on the Montalegre and the boutiques. And these another ones surrounding the uh, city of Guarda. Uh, in this uh, first case, in the north, uh, we are dealing with uh, uh, pegmatites that were exploited till the 60s for other uh, metals, for uh, example, for tungsten, uh, tin. And in the second case, uh, we are dealing with uh, present-day uh, uh, active uh, uh, exploitations of feldspars uh, and micas uh, for ceramics and, and the glass industries. Uh, in green, we have the represent geographical representation of protected areas. That's why, for instance, in this case, the possible exploitation is, does not include this intermediated area because is a, a protected area. Uh, so, uh, uh, in general, of in the general cases, we are. Uh, I can see uh, uh, being uh, uh, very concerned 
with the importance of preserving the protected areas. Of course, this is a, 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 a very hard uh, work. It's not, it's not easy to conceal both uh, issues. The four most important uh, pegmatite uh, fields uh, bearing lithium are represented here. Uh, in my particular case, uh, uh, I've been involved in this uh, uh, Barroso uh, uh, Montalegre uh, pegmatite uh, deposit. Uh, we are ending, finishing the uh, strategic uh, environmental study. Uh, the reserves are quite interesting. Uh, and the main issue at the moment is to try to put forward an association between all potential lithium producers to uh, not only extract uh, the uh, mineral, but also to process the metal. Uh, and so I, so I, it's, it's the final one. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, uh, just to have uh, uh, an idea of concentration, uh, uh, I choose uh, an example of one of the exploitations that are producing not lithium, but feldspar. Uh, uh, of course, at the moment, the main goal is to produce feldspar. Uh, and in this case, we are interested on, on uh, uh, alkaline elements uh, here in bold, but also to aluminium content. But the mineral that was considered till now as a contaminant is petalite. And now petalite is becoming the main uh, mineral of this exploitation. And in this particular case, in, in the center of the, the country, the uh, uh, content of petalite in these odds are close to 4, 4.32. It's very good of uh, lithium oxide. So we consider that uh, Portugal can actually uh, become, on near future, uh, uh, one of the major, if not the major, uh, uh, lithium producer on European Union. And uh, that's all. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Fernando, for showing us that it's a complicated issue, that it is something that we already exploited, but we need to think about more about it in Europe, about our resources. Mm -hmm. We move to the second part of this morning's session with uh, a talk on lithium ion batteries in the automotive sector. So we uh, focus on this specific sector with Christina Estrem. Christina Estrem is professor of inorganic chemistry at Uppsala University in Sweden and director of the large scale European research initiative Battery 2030 Plus, which is positioned uh, as a long term research community with the mission to reinvent the way we invent the batteries of the future. She studies lithium ion batteries and sodium ion batteries, solid state batteries, and other new sustainable battery chemistries. Christina Estrem's particular interest is to study interfaces between materials and components where she has developed in situ operando techniques. Christina leads the Engstrom Advanced Battery Center in Uppsala. She has published more than 300 scientific papers and is an elected member of the Royal Academy of Engineering Sciences, EVA, where she also serves as a board member. She's elected member of the Royal Academy of Sciences in Sweden, honorary doctor at Norwegian University of Science and Technology. She received the KTH Grand Prize, the gold medal from IVA, and she's a Wallenberg Scholar. She is the scientific coordinator of Battery Sweden and a trustee in the board of Faraday Initiative UK. Please, Christina, the floor is yours. Thank you so very much for this very nice introduction. <clears throat> and thank you for allowing me to talk about lithium ion batteries in automotives. And uh, 
in this introduction, I didn't, don't need to say so much more than that this battery 2030 plus is actually comprising 102 organizations in 24 different countries in Europe, so two, uh, 20 in the member states and, and four associated countries. I'm also proud to say that lithium <coughs> was actually discovered in, uh, on an archipelago, in the archipelago of Stockholm, slightly more than uh, 100 years ago. Uh, so we celebrated the 100 year anniversary 2018 for this company. And uh, it took a long time before we could actually work on it. And now there are different initiatives. And if we look particularly on automotives, uh, we can see that there is an, a huge increase uh, in the amount of automotives. We heard here in the introduction by our chair that we, in Italy, you expect to have 40% of all the uh, uh, passenger cars being, uh, being uh, electric by 2030. In uh, the Scandinavian countries where I come from, it's even so that in Norway, they think looking at the uh, exploiting what's going on now and, and looking at the situation, they think that the last combustion engine car will be sold by 2025. And in Sweden, if you look at the new sales of, of, of automotives, uh, we have moved from almost nothing two years ago to 40% uh, of the market. So it's, it's something happening, it's penetrating. Uh, among the normal citizen. And that has actually meant, if you look at this uh, slide, which I have uh, very kindly been given to me by, by Inno Energy and EBA 250, which is one of the other European initiatives in this field, because there's a lot of going on at European um, seen to, to really promote the, the field of batteries at the moment, we can see that Europe is actually world leading when it comes to uh, all electric and plug-in uh, in hybrid electric, electrics in the world. So this is quite interesting that we, it has boomed up so rapidly and that many of the car uh, manufacturers in Europe claim that they will have, and we also see new, uh, uh, versions of, of electric cars coming out on the market, getting better and better with more and more of driving ranges, being more and more economic. <clears throat> and the question, uh, uh, if we go back in time, five, six years ago, there was this study uh, uh, with more a life cycle analysis perspective showing that um, you, uh, you have carbon dioxide emissions when making and electric vehicles, but and uh, compared to a diesel car, it would take you two, two years to gain, sort of uh, 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 come up to the same carbon dioxide emissions. But after three, two years of use, the, um, the EV would win. Um, so it's a question on when. Uh, today, there are new studies saying that it's actually going much better for the electric vehicles. They are less carbon dioxide emitting uh, and that it's also very dependent on where your batteries are made. If they are made on renewable uh, sources of uh, electricity, if they're driven on renewable or if they are driven on uh, coal, coal energy. So uh, to work on, on the uh, mix of the energy system as such will be very important for uh, claiming that this is a carbon neutral technology. And we can also see that there is a large interest to build gigafactories because this transition would mean that we, we need to actually uh, have a good uh, sort of production of battery cells in in Europe, and it's a worry from the automotive companies in Europe that they don't, can't get hold of enough of battery cells. And therefore we see this picture sort of growing by almost by the year. And we see that we have many companies coming from Asia where they are done, where they are produced today, like Samsung. Uh, and we have also LG, 
being in Poland, etc. And we can see that in, also in, in the Scandinavian countries, we have initiatives, we have it in UK as well. And uh, so it, it's a lot happening here. And the, it will be interesting to see how many of these initiatives that really will survive and give, give us the batteries we think we need. And of course, one stronghold for the being Swedish and for Norfolk is that they are going to produce it where they have very have a, a good contract for hydro energy to make these batteries. And then they will ship them down here to uh, with boats to um, Germany and, and make battery packs and so on in collaboration with Volkswagen, for instance. And it's very clear when we discuss with different companies, uh, automotive companies, that they see themselves as not that large buyers. So they need to secure this kind of techniques. And uh, Volvo cars is going directly into the um, electric vehicle market, saying by 2025, 50% of all cars will be, that they sell will be uh, all electric. You look at the heavy duty vehicles, Scania says that they will go for batteries only, while Volvo, AB Volvo says 50% will in the future also be hydrogen-based um, technologies. And uh, I think we have to play the, the whole toolbox we have if we want to move forward and be more climate neutral. And of course, this will put a lot of strain also on the needs of minerals and systems. So the the earlier presentations we heard about the geopolitical situation for lithium, that's a, of, of course a crucial discussion. And if we go now more into the chemistry of a battery, because uh, chemistry is really what I do and my colleagues, and we try to push the field, moving from the Nobel Prize system, which was lithium cobalt oxide with lots of cobalt, and, and uh, with graphite as the negative electrode, where we know that uh, uh, natural graphite is an issue, uh, also from as a critical element. We heard that in the first presentation, and that sulfetic uh, graphite needs to be produced in a way that is carbon dioxide neutral as well. So there's each component in a battery has its own sort of play and discussion on how to make it as sustainable as possible. And that's, of course, very important for, for vehicles. And um, um, <coughs> looking also at the uh, positive electrode and, and the structure of it, uh, we are today trying to replace the cobalt for much more nickel and manganese. There's still some... Um, cobalt in it, and the reason for that is that it actually adds stability to the uh, atomic structure. Yeah. But by playing with the kind of metals we are using in the positive electrode, you actually, together with the, 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 the amount of lithium you can store in the negative electrode, you can get out, you can actually calculate the energy content of your um, system. And there, if we talk about voltage. So if you use a um, lithium iron phosphate, which was mentioned earlier, you get a lower voltage than if you use a nickel cobalt manganese based one. And that means that you actually lose a little bit of capacity with the lithium iron phosphate, but you might compare to the nickel cobalt manganese. So um, sorry for showing you some uh, some formulas, but I think this is a sort of important discussion to have why scientists play with these different metals, etc. Uh, if we then look into the battery as well, and here we have an example of lithium ion phosphate and we have our graphite, we have also lots of materials and, and uh, things where the lithium metal can be trapped. Because one important thing we need to address is, of course, recycling. And with the new uh, battery regulation, it said that by 2030, at least 70% of the lithium in a lithium ion battery should be able to be recycled. And it has not been sort of commercially interesting before. So 
uh, now we look scientifically into the role of trying to recycle lithium. And um, uh, I think that's an extremely important to remember that the lithium ion cell contains about four to five percent lithium. And this little lithium ion puts itself into the different materials, into the atomic structures. So it's actually a little bit of a challenge. But what you want to do is to get it out as either lithium carbonate or lithium hydroxide, because the lithium carbonate you use directly into the synthesis of the positive electrode. So you don't have to go uh, into a carbon dioxide emitting reactions for, for getting your cathode material. So uh, when it comes to the lithium ion battery world, we are playing with a number of different uh, positive electrodes based on different metals and also a number of negative electrodes. And looking at this picture you, you, and seeing that we have capacity here and we have this voltage here, I said that uh, going up in, in voltage means that you can have higher capacity, um, but it also uh, puts other strains on the material. You can see here that graphite is not one of the most uh, the energy content rich uh, negative electrode. It's far away from li li metallic lithium. And you see there are the different uh, possibilities in between here. And uh, what you want is that the distance between these are as, as uh, large as possible. Uh, and therefore graphite is important. And the reason why we don't today play so much with the lithium metal though we would like to because it's so energy rich, that is of safety reasons. So graphite can host lithium ions that uh, can give you this safety. And it has to do a lot with the interfaces in, in between the components in the battery. And you also can say that uh, that it's actually energy richer, this graphite, when, than all the positive electron materials. So there has been, during the last 30, 35 years where I've been in this business, a lot of research to really, really press the capacity of the positive electron. That's one bottleneck. If we can find materials here, that uh, can give us better solutions. And therefore, People are now looking back and looking into the lithium metal question again. And if we, if we go from the graphite as a negative electrode towards lithium metal, you will see that we actually need more and more of the lithium, which is the electrical problem. So what are the cathodes that we look at for the lithium ion batteries today? For automotive specifically, well, it's iron phosphate because it's safe and it's abundant. Uh, it's, it's this kind of NMCs, as they are called. You know, battery abbreviations are very much based on the sort of metals you have. So this is called LFP, with the F being for the iron, NMC, nickel, manganese, cobalt. It can be N, NCA as well, nickel, manganese, aluminum, for instance. And so these are important. And for the negative electrode, we try to put some silicon into the graphite to press the capacity more towards the pure lithium and still keep the safety of it. So <clears throat> the expected next generations for lithium ion batteries were in the set plan of Europe are called uh, generation 3B, for instance, that is to go from uh, NMC with six nickel, two manganese, and two cobalt towards lithium rich ones that contain uh, 811 of this composition, or even further to uh, nine half half. But re can we get rid of the cobalt directly? It's a challenge because you need to have a material that is stable for discharge and charge of a battery cell more than 2,000 times today. But it's, we have these materials, but then we run into the issue 
of uh, have return of investment for recycling because cobalt is really giving you the return of investment as a recycling company. So if we need to recycle more of lithium and cobalt, we need to look at new business models, maybe incentives, et cetera, to handle that. So there are a lot of questions, of course, as been pointed out already about the, the raw materials. I don't think I need to go into that more. Uh, and also I pointed out a little bit of the issues with recycling. I, um, you see there are two arrows here, and I think this is really important because uh, we can talk about capacity either in terms of weight or in terms of, of uh, volume. And for automotives, the volume, how much energy you can put into a container is really important. And of course, at some part here, close in time, we are actually leveling out and we can't go so much further. Then we must go to post-lithium ion. And post-lithium ion can be a number of things that uh, are now in the research pipeline and very important research, I would say. It's sodium batteries, because there we don't have the geopolitical issue with the lithium. I think that will be discussed after lunch. It will be very important and interesting and uh, see how far that can compete with lithium ion battery. We have also uh, a number of other systems that we are talking about. But before I go into to, uh, that more, I just want to discuss a little bit more the uh, cathode material and the anode material, the lithium ion phosphate. Because that was almost out of the question uh, just a few years ago. And then Tesla came with this uh, announcement earlier uh, this year, or if it was the end of last year, that it will change the type of battery cells it's used in all standard range cars and go for lithium ion phosphate. And why, why did it? And that sort of echoed in the whole battery community. Cheaper than NMC is one reason. Lower energy, because that's a lower voltage in this plot I showed you earlier. But um, here, by playing at the systems level, looking at not only the chemistry inside the battery cell, but also how you sort of design your cell to, to, uh, to accommodate thicker electrodes and more material, you can actually make a difference and get more uh, energy into a sort of your container, your volume. It's also safer. Uh, it's a lot of oxygen in the nickel, manganese, cobalt oxides that can burn. You don't have that at all in, at the same level in the lithium ion phosphate. So there are many considerations. Another thing I want to point out is the difficulty, the race we have now in Europe on, on silicon and graphite as the negative electrode to have more of this silicon. And the reason for for that is, of course, that we can get more energy and better driving range into our battery and hopefully uh, also work more on the fast charging properties, which are also an issue for electric vehicles and automotives. And there are a number of ongoing uh, uh, projects looking at this, European projects now ongoing there, and there is one battery 2030 plus project I would like to point out, which is uh, uh, headed by Free uh, University in Brussels, where trying to have the problem with silicon that you have a lot of energy can be stored by lithium alloying with silicon particles and they get very big. And when you extract the lithium ions, the silicon particles shrink a lot. And that gives you micro damage of the silicon particles, et cetera. And, of the whole electron. And by playing now with new kinds of self-healing polymers uh, and uh, see if we can accommodate that problem and actually make these uh, electrons work, that would be a great step for automotives. But, uh, and of course, when you do this, you have to think of recycling. You have to think also of the processes uh, and think green chemistry when you are doing this. So it's a very exciting uh, new, new research you can do on sort of what you call mature systems in the lithium battery system. Um, I also 
want to say something about uh, solid state lithium ion batteries, because I think that is also something that is very, very much up in the air. Soon we have the solid state uh, um, batteries based on lithium metal and, and uh, a, a good cathode material that gives you something. And if we look at the power we can get and also the specific energy, we have a specific target region here, which uh, is, is where these uh, batteries should meet. And uh, here is also how it could work at higher uh, potentials. It, it, there, there is a lot of challenges for solid state batteries. We have uh, going on in the battery cells. There, uh, when you have lithium metal, I said it was not safe. That's why we have graphite. You have dendrites coming out, uh, reacting here. And you can have a ceramic solid where the this dendrites can go in and penetrate it. You have reaction at the interfaces that you don't really control. You can have it on the positive electrode as well. There are some chemical mechanic uh, reactions of electrodes and crack formation we have to, uh, to handle. So, uh, and also the kinetics and reaction mechanism through this system. So when it was said by some companies uh, uh, that this technology will come in cars around 2020, we have still not seen it. And discussing with for instance, Jürgen Janik is one of the co-authors on this paper. He thinks, yeah, but we have so many issues to solve, so maybe we see it in 10 years' time, and not as soon as we think. So this is really a, 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 a very vivid research area where we will see when this comes. And my message here is that the lithium-ion battery will uh, be very, very prominent and uh, long-lasting for, for the nearest 10 years. And I don't think the solid-state battery really will be the competition. I think the sodium battery will be much more interesting. Uh, uh, Tina, are, you are a little bit out of time now. Oh, sorry. Then I should just end by saying that something that the automotive industry are very interested in, that's aging safety and more systems aspects of these batteries. And there are a lot of issues going on around focusing on developing BMS algorithms to measure, uh, can we trust the battery in a car, for instance? And uh, by this, I say that the new digitalization tools we're developing, like in Battery 2030 Plus and in Big Bat Project, that is something that uh, I hope can help the future. And by this, I just want to point out there are some roadmaps that you can read that just been published uh, recently. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Christina. It was uh, very, very interesting seeing what's going on with batteries which use and potential use in the future for the automotive sector. So questions later on for the uh, discussion, we move to the next application for lithium ion batteries, which is being um, implemented, which are lithium ion batteries for stationary applications. And uh, the speaker on that will be Luigi Lanuzza, who holds a master's degree in electronic engineering from the University of Messina, Italy, and a master in photovoltaic and engineering from the University of Rome, Tor Vergata. After having worked at the University of Pisa as associate researcher, he moved to the semiconductors industry. In 2009, he joined Enel Green Power, EGP, the renewable electricity production arm of the Italian energy giant Enel, as part of the development and construction teams of the PV modules factory 3 Sun. Then in 2012, he was part of the startup of EGP activities in South Africa, managing the development of several large scale solar projects. In 2013, he moved to the innovation department, managing the program of the first uh, EGP storage pilot projects as head of energy storage. Since 2017, Luigi is part of NLX, uh, the, next, the new division of the NL Group focusing on advanced energy services and products and developing cross-technologies, integrated solutions. 
where he is currently head of B2C and B2B Innovation Factory. Luigi is a fellow of the Energy Foundation and a member of the executive board of the Battery European Partnership Association and chair of the World Group 6 of Batteries Europe. Please, Luigi, the floor is yours now. Thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, for inviting me, first of all, uh, and for uh, the presentation. Uh, I will uh, go uh, to the uh, to the slide. Just a moment. Okay. Uh, I think you see my my screen now. Uh, and I, yes, I, we do. Go ahead. Yes, uh, very, very, I will be very brief in the beginning. Uh, so, uh, who are as NLX? NLX is the, the newest division of NL Group. Uh, basically, we are not doing uh, the classic like, utility business, uh, we are doing energy services for our customer. And uh, the pillars are sustainability and uh, using uh, more uh, energy in, in a more efficient way. So basically, electrification is uh, one of the drivers together with digitalization. Uh, digitalization is a word which uh, can appear a bit uh, distant from uh, the raw material world, but uh, I'm, I believe that this, uh, the, this distance is, is becoming uh, lower and lower, and that, uh, there are a lot of uh, possible uh, synergies which are coming now. Uh, then, of course, the IME is also producing new services and products for our customers, uh, but again, in a, a way which must be sustainable as a driver of vinyl group, which are, we are part of. Uh, just a snapshot, and the group is one of the uh, first hundred uh, biggest company in the world and uh, probably the, the biggest uh, utility in the world for many uh, fields. Uh, uh, we speak about uh, the renewable generation, we are the first in the world, uh, not considering uh, uh, Chinese uh, uh, government-owned companies. Uh, this number 49 gigawatt is going to become uh, more about double within uh, some years, uh, there, is, there has been a presentation of the industrial plan a few years ago, a uh, few days ago, sorry, uh, last week. Uh, and then uh, it's impressive also the number of customers, which uh, finally are stakeholders. These are customers on the grid, uh, which means also industrial, commercial installation. So if you think to the stakeholders uh, connected to these, uh, each, uh, each connection uh, <coughs> under uh, these 74 millions of connections, there are four, five customers. So we speak about several hundred millions of customers worldwide. And these are only customers on uh, the free market of energy, for instance. Uh, <clears throat> then uh, demand response is the newest business for us, is uh, uh, driven by NLX, uh, and we are the biggest in the world, uh, with about six gigawatt, uh, almost seven now. <clears throat> which means uh, creating uh, flexibility from the asset of third parties, our customer again. Uh, so services to the grid by mean of using uh, the asset of our customer and of course creating value also for them. <clears throat> then uh, this slide show how we are divided by uh, customers again. Pillars are the customer verticals. So business to government, business to industry, and business to end customer retail. But I just throw this for let you know that uh, batteries and uh, let's call it uh, lithium ion batteries because 99.99 are lithium ion batteries. I think they're all uh, only lithium ion batteries. So what we are speaking as of today in uh, NLX uh, are present in the industrial sector, of course. Uh, we do from the, the small commercial industrial up to the large scale installation, um, also integrated with large uh, power plants, renewable power plants. And the scale nowadays is in the range of some hundred megawatts for uh, two, four hours of uh, storage. So let's call uh, it 400 megawatt hours. Uh, range of uh, batteries integrated in renewable power plants um, and also in our houses. Uh, you have to think concerning the retail sector that uh, um, almost 75% of 
PV system in Italy as they are sold with battery integrated. Uh, thanks also to good uh, regulation uh, promoting uh, uh, energy communities, for instance. So the sharing of the energy, the uh, self-consumption inside of the energy produced by renewables. And of course, uh, we have this transversal sector, the mobility, which uh, interests, uh, it's interesting the business to government. We have the, the business of the e-bus is directly driven by NLX. So we take care of the battery seers and also in some countries we are uh, responsible for the end of the batteries uh, because we are importing e-bus. Then, uh, of course, uh, B2B. Here we speak about the large storage system uh, integrated in the charging point uh, and, of course, home charging. In this case, <clears throat> just to, to let you know, now we are installing uh, high power charges in the range of 200, then very soon 300, 350 kilowatts for each connection points. Uh, in a charging station, at least we think uh, we, we speak about the six charging points of this range. So you can imagine the huge amount of power which we we'll need in the next days, <laughs> almost in the next months, in the in our streets, in the distribution network, which is uh, often not ready for supporting this uh, uh, huge amount of power uh, which is needed instantaneously. We speak about uh, several megawatts for installation, just uh, as a reference. And if you are in the highway, it can be even worse because uh, not always there are uh, high power connection to the uh, charging point, to the uh, refueling station in the highways, of course. So you may think to have uh, uh, even off-grid system or at least a buffer of large batteries for supporting this uh, recharge system. And of course, uh, all this is a huge amount of batteries uh, uh, distributed in our houses, in our uh, workplaces, uh, in our streets. Uh, I will start saying that uh, as of today for station storage, <coughs> The market is dominating by lithium iron phosphate, as Christina uh, said just before. So even in the cars uh, with the Tesla, the announcement by Tesla is uh, uh, already happening. But uh, station storage came. This happened first uh, before uh, I would say because of the cost, because of the duration, so uh, the, the number of cycles, and because of safety these batteries are in our offices, in our houses. So safety for the utility world is a key, a real key driver. Uh, the pillars, again, uh, are part of the digestion because uh, you will see we need to manage from remote a uh, huge amount of asset. Digitalization, integration, we speak again about all integrated system and the commercial site at our, our houses and the ecosystem. <clears throat> so, we are moving towards a green world. Uh, as Enel, we declared that we will, uh, we will be global net at zero by 2050. So, everything uh, will be made by renewable generation and uh, every application, everything we, we will buy, for instance, uh, we will procure, uh, will need to be uh, net zero and uh, we will need also certification for this. So that's why, uh, as uh, I said in the beginning, digitalization comes together also with the raw material procurement with the, the certification on the, all the supply chain. But let's come back to the flexibility. So uh, having a lot of renewables deployed in, in our uh, houses, but also in the power plants, means that we need to deal with an intermittent source, which can be the sun, which can be the wind. Uh, in case of the sun or the solar, the intermittency is the range of some milliseconds. This can be the, the time scale. In case of wind, uh, perhaps it's not so fast, but it's a, a huge amount of energy, which can change in seconds, minutes. Uh, in this chart in the left, you see, sorry, you see the request of flexibility, which will be uh, predominant in a uh, country like Germany, Italy, UK in the years to come. But uh, uh, we are close to this date. Uh, it's 2030, and uh, we are now very close to this. 
uh, in the, uh, with the increasing of uh, re renewable generation. <coughs> Flexibility means that we need to address this uh, from the very short, ultra short term in this chart, so, so sub-second scale up to the long term for having a, a real reserve of energy produced by renewables. I have to say that uh, uh, up to the short terms, to the days, perhaps is not something happening already the days, but it will, uh, is a request from the market, it will happen soon. By the way, by the way uh, up to the eight hour scale of storage, lithium is again dominating against the flow batteries, against uh, all the announcement uh, uh, we have seen in the last years. Uh, reality is different. So uh, as of today, if you can do a project, you can do by lithium ion batteries and uh, typically lithium ion phosphate is the solution. Of course, uh, as a research innovation, we are addressing the long-term storage is some of the requests we addressed in the roadmaps of the ATIP of battery euros, for instance, as well in the uh, in the BEPA, in the Battery European uh, Partnership. Uh, here, the, the need is for having an efficient way for store large amount of uh, energy. Uh, I will go again fast in these. <clears throat> these are the services which we provide to our customer or to the grid or the independent power producers. You see, these are always services in maximum four hours, perhaps eight hours here in the arbiter. That's why medium iron is really dominating uh, the, the, the market. And for us, the, the effort is integrating all the these services, sorry, in a stacking of services for having more uh, value from the battery. This is the real challenge we have together with the driver of safety gain and uh, uh, reliability as a utility. Just a, a, a snapshot of uh, what is uh, the request uh, of the market and what will be. So here is just Europe. And uh, from these uh, public sources, uh, the, the evidence is that uh, by 2030, we will have uh, an impressive grow of uh, installation from one gigawatt in 2020 up to 35 gigawatts in 2030 only 10 years and 35 pair, uh, <coughs> which uh, will uh, happen uh, again in every application from utility scale to residential, which will need new technologies. We are looking with interest, uh, for instance, in, uh, to sodium ion batteries. Uh, some big player announced the introduction into the market. Uh, perhaps, uh, uh, faster than expected, I would say. Uh, by the way, again, I agree with uh, Christine again, uh, the lithium ion uh, technology will be there uh, at least uh, up to this uh, uh, date dominating the, the market. Uh, so we need to address the request of uh, material for making these batteries, of course. And uh, of course, uh, efficiency for the land duration uh, storage, which Actually, we don't see now. We will have likely by 2030, but let's see what will happen. And the, the, the integration with the, the generations, for instance, uh, source. Okay, this is what we where we are with batteries in the world. I also would add that if you taking a consideration for the global power generation, so our division, which is the uh, producing energy, basically all the world is covered, uh, perhaps uh, only China is of day, but is a country where, as an elix, uh, we are starting the, the activities. And again, the needs of <coughs> uh, cloud-based uh, control, uh, so the software able to detect every drift and uh, every uh, things happening both from the uh, beyond the meters from the utility uh, for the grid uh, side but also a lot of in, uh, importance as the, the, the what happened at home at, uh, in our offices we are investing a lot in uh, again <coughs> uh, forecasting for instance the the, the, the uh, degradation of the batteries prevent critical faults 
and uh, modeling uh, the, the, the batteries uh, which we have in our houses again or in the, in the recharge system. Uh, and this is happening uh, instantaneously, uh, second by second. Uh, <coughs> how we do, we support the business uh, uh, thanks also to the increasing uh, supply chain in Europe for batteries. We are part of this since the beginning. This slide is actually from the beginning of the beta, so the battery association. Uh, but we were here, we were in the foundation of the European Battery Alliance. We were part of the uh, creation of the ATIP uh, and also the BEV, of course. And we participated with the RTCI, the important project of common European interest on batteries in the first uh, one and in the second one. Uh, in the first one, uh, we focalized on uh, digitalization, so digital twin of batteries again, uh, for predicting faults, critical faults. Uh, there is an issue of safety. You can imagine uh, uh, there, there were some incidents, uh, accidents, sorry, for, uh, with the NMC technology mainly. Uh, so preventing the faults is a strong driver, of course and degradation help uh, the, 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 the business itself. And also we are leveraging on the RPCI for having the uh, storage labs. So place where we test and validate the software models, the digital twin together with the other partners of the RPCI because one of the drivers of the RPCI was creating the chain and uh, making the project of the different participant talking one to, to each other. So we are working with some of the uh, players uh, which we saw before, so the, the ones that were making the, the Gigafactory in Europe, for integrating the software models, the data coming from the cells, uh, from the production also, in our models, and then being able to trace and uh, validate uh, through the digital twin models what will happen in a real contest, real laboratory, but real case of usage, uh, which are simulated in our laboratories. Then in the second PCI, <clears throat> we deal with the high power charger backed by batteries. Uh, and here the interesting thing is that uh, we, uh, we also test second life batteries for this application. This was a request from the European Commission uh, which is promoting cell life batteries because it is a kind of uh, small uh, uh, tile of a big picture. If we extend the, le the life of the batteries, of course, we are using better the materials. We are lowering down the cost, but also extending means a lower footprint, carbon footprint of the battery itself. Because instead of having 2,000 cycles, maximum 1,000 half cycles in, the, uh, in a car, we can extend up to 5,000, perhaps, uh, depending on the application, of course, uh, cycles, uh, which mean less usage of raw materials or better usage of raw materials. And this is also a piece, as I told you, because we are also addressing in the second IPCI, which is focusing on, uh, uh, sorry, uh, on these uh, sustainability items, we are also supporting the end-of-life batteries in a project with other Italian players aiming to do uh, R&D activities, collaborating with Enea, uh, with uh, Midac, which is a company uh, making batteries in, in Italy, the, one of the largest companies in Italy, uh, addressing these particular sectors the, in the pre-treatment, so-called pre-treatment process. Uh, there is a missing automation and we will develop uh, robots uh, able to understand what are the, the, the characteristics of the battery packs coming from cars, for instance. Uh, as well as a kind of uh, oral tradition, how to dismantle a single pack of which is individual uh, producer. We aim to have this automatized able to addressing uh, something like uh, 60,000 uh, kilos, uh, tons, sorry. Uh, per year of uh, battery packs only in Italy. So it's uh, an impressive amount of uh, batteries which uh, should arrive at the end of life in 2030, but perhaps uh, due to the increasing numbers of EV cars, uh, which we see in our, uh, in our streets, uh, this will happen before, even before. 
Uh, and then, of course, the uh, optimization of the pretreatment process. There is a lot of work to be done here. And uh, uh, how to store this uh, huge amount of batteries packs uh, in a safe way, how to move them. There is a lack also of uh, uh, regulation for this. Uh, and these are also, all, all these are precious materials which are going around and uh, shall be managed with the appropriate safety. Uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, attention, attention safety. <clears throat> and now to evaluate the, the, these materials of the excess battery, batteries. Uh, again, the challenge for us here is that we will manage batteries coming from the utility, so lithium ion phosphate batteries, which as of today has not so much value. Uh, and if also uh, car will have uh, lithium ion phosphate batteries uh, on board, this is a challenge for the industry. So we will need to do it because of regulation, because of the real uh, address of sustainability, uh, but we will need uh, to do it in an efficient and also economical way, efficient way. Uh, so let's think to how to, to manage uh, in this way this amount of batteries which will for sure have. Uh, just in our uh, roadmap as ZRL only, we speak about uh, installation of more than 10 gigawatts uh, in the world of uh, batteries, which as of today are lithium ion phosphate. Uh, volumes of for cars are, of course, uh, in a scale of 10, uh, 10 times at least compared to utility to the uh, stationary storage. So let's think to, to it for sure, because it finally is a source of raw material. Uh, lithium, as of today, perhaps we don't see the need of having a recycling, but within five years, this will happen. Is an evidence of the markets. Uh, and finally, also, <clears throat> okay, this other project again, we and we ask it to, to develop the uh, basically the digital twin of the second life batteries, also in the uh, second uh, IPCI, the autumn IPCI. Uh, just an overview uh, these are the laboratories under construction. We are, uh, we are almost out of time. Okay. Uh, that is uh, what uh, we are doing, uh, just as a result, uh, the degradation, uh, the anomaly detection, something really promising, and we are investing a lot of efforts. And the uh, last one, this is uh, another laboratory under construction. You may ask where are the batteries. These are 13 HP HPC system, high power chip system, each one by 300 kilowatts. And the batteries basically are here underneath. So when we speak about uh, constraints uh, of batteries, uh, let's think to uh, what does it mean having some like a uh, half megawatt tower system in a room underneath the uh, the park uh, where we have the high power system. Let's think of the connection or high power charger. Uh, they need a lot of power, lead, uh, a lot of cables. So these are just to give you an idea of what uh, are the challenges about safety and uh, about cost, of course, and about uh, uh, the need of having a compact uh, system, very uh, small footprint also in a, a commercial industrial installation. Um, I don't know if uh, uh, I'm out of time. Yes, yes, you are. Okay. Okay. So uh, just thank you. Uh, for the invitation again. Thank you very much, Luigi, uh, for uh, letting us understand that uh, uh, storage is possible, storage is a challenge, but we have now the instruments because we are in the 21st century. We are no longer uh, talking about uh, the 20th century because when you speak with people, sometimes they say it's not possible, but they are reasoning in terms of 1980s or 1990s. Now it's a different world and we can do it. Thank you so much. So now it's time for the, um, uh, for the panel so we can open the discussion and the discussion will be led by Catherine Sanderson. And uh, Catherine got her Bachelor and Master of Research degrees in Chemistry from Imperial College London and her PhD in Organometallic Chemistry from Cambridge University. 
She switched to science journalism where, whilst working at the Royal Society of Chemistry, where she was a features editor and science correspondent for, for Chemistry World magazine. She then worked for Nature for several years as a news reporter and editor covering the physical sciences. She has a very then successful freelance career writing for publications including Nature, New Scientist, Chemistry World, Chemical and Engineering News, BBC and more. Catherine also teaches science writing to undergraduates at the University of Leeds and King's College London. She's one of the executive board of the Association of British Science Writers. Please, Catherine, uh, lead us in this discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction and what a fascinating morning. I've really enjoyed all the talks. We've got a few questions that have come up from our participants. Um, sorry, from the attendees, which uh, will help lead the direction of our discussion but first I wanted to go to the poll that we had earlier about who what colour should lithium be and I think we see the answers here so 50% uh, say orange and then the second most popular one is yellow followed by red and then uh, a very small proportion is green thank you for that Laura um, so I wanted to talk to ask the panellists their views on that. Um, and we already know, Fernando, you say yellow. I'd like to know, David, what, what your thoughts are in particular on that, the results of that poll. Uh, yeah, I think that's very, very interesting. I, I left the question open at the end because I think it, it, it's difficult to work out, but I do think that probably orange is the colour I would go for. I think uh, if we continue to use lithium at the moment at the rate we are, it should be red, actually. Mm -hmm. but if we do recycling, sorry, as we are at the moment, it's orange. But if we continue to develop lithium batteries in the way we plan to, then it has to be red unless we can do the recycling. And the plan in Europe is to recycle 90%, then it becomes much, much better. So yeah, I think yeah. in balance, I would go for orange. Okay. Christina, do you have a, an opinion on this? Yes. I would go for yellow if we have recycling and orange if we go for non-recycling, but we, we really need to push recycling as not the option. We just have to do it. And yeah. reaching 70% to 2030 is a challenge. 55% to 2025 is also a challenge. We have to work hard on it. And Luigi, what, what do you think about where we are with lithium. Uh, absolutely, uh, I agree not uh, uh, we need to recycle uh, and uh, let's hope that uh, it will be uh, enough, but like not. Uh, from some forecasts uh, I've seen uh, in market reports again, uh, we may have some shortage uh, in 2026, 27. Uh, so um, let's start now to, to address this. Right. Yeah. Um, Fernando, yes, how you got your hand up? I just uh, wanted to justify why my, my position is yellow. Because from a, a geological point of view, we are just scratching the surface of the Earth. So we, in these last 30 or 40 years, did not uh, do any deep uh, prospection of lithium or other metal, with the exception of gold, uh, quite different from oil industry. So uh, I stress again, we are just scratching the surface. So we have surely much more uh, 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 reserves than are known today. So I'm quite optimist concerning primary resources and. I agree with Christina uh, uh, in what concerns uh, recycling. Great. So, uh, for Thank me, you. it could be our. Great. Okay. Um, so, yes, quite a, a mixed, well, the same view, I think, but it depends on what the future holds in terms of recycling as to yes, whether we yes. can stand up what we say about the colours. Um, we've had a few questions in 
from our, as I said, from our at attendees. So I'll turn to some of those now. Um, Wolfgang Kautek asks a few questions. Uh, basically, he's saying is, um, are the costs to making things out of lithium and the non-renewable electricity perhaps that might be used, basically, do they override the importance of uh, lithium battery technology? Um, the, so his questions say, um, Technologies to replace fossil fuels in industrial processes, steel production, electric power generation, and cement production is needed. Can lithium technology solve that problem, essentially? Who would like to tackle that? Christina. I don't think it can solve that uh, problem. I don't think we've ever said that lithium ion batteries can solve every technical problem we have in the world. I think we need to work with a full toolbox of alternatives. Steel production in Sweden is going for hydrogen at, at the moment to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. We have to start looking at uh, possibilities and uh, all kinds of energy uh, sources uh, that we can. Many, and batteries are for energy storage and they are making comfort to our lives. But, yeah. But it can't solve the whole picture, no. Luigi, did you have anything to add to that? Because I suppose some of these things could come down to large scale storage being used instead of um, coal power, perhaps? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you mean for addressing also the, the extraction of material? But there is a huge process of electrification going in every industrial sector and uh, mining is something that uh, yes for sure is addressed with a strong attention from our world especially uh, with making energy services um, we have a lot of talks uh, for a uh, mining company uh, for providing uh, uh, contracts uh, directly with uh, you you can do uh, if we think about to chile which is uh, one of the most important countries for us we have a huge installation of renewables uh, because also the constraint, uh, we, we don't have so much constraint, let's say, because it's a desertic area, uh, we, you can do with a lot of radiation, so radiation. The same uh, in Australia, for instance. And uh, interesting is when you go into the process and uh, uh, there are a lot of saving that the companies can do and they want, the mining company, they want to do, uh, because instead of having, uh, for instance, also uh, diesel generation, diesel uh, trucks, uh, they can save a lot of money uh, just uh, taking account for the thermal energy that they don't need to dissipate. I'm speaking about, uh, of course, uh, uh, mining underneath the, 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 the earth. Uh, so yes, is uh, for sure something that uh, we can address and lowering down the, 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 the consumption of not renewable sources. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So something that I thought of during um, Fernando's talk um, was about uh, building lithium into a circular economy. Is it the case that we now have to dig up all the lithium we can before we then start to recycle it? Do we have enough now? Um, and I'll come on to this later. There are um, uh, maybe some other sources of lithium that need to be looked at that may be more sustainable. Is there, a, is there an amount of lithium that we need to have in our hands before we can start moving to a circular economy where we haven't have enough for our batteries? No. Yes, David. Well, I would comment that uh, if we don't recycle lithium, we're going to have an absolutely massive waste problem as well, because if we're going to have all these cars, I mean, lifetime of a car is maybe five or 10 years. And so in five or 10 years, we can have all these cars, which have got lithium batteries in them. And what do we do with that? All those lithium batteries, if we don't recycle the elements in them, I think there's a two sided thing here. One is the supply side, which actually I think is still serious. I mean, we look at uh, the, 
easily extracted lithium at, at about 16 million tons, and that's only about 20 years worth of cars. So we will have to recycle it and, and, unless we want to spend an awful lot more getting it out. Uh -huh. So it seems to me there are two twin aspects to that, the recycling. One is the supply and the other is the waste. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. And um, there's a really good question here from Giuseppe Mustmara. The goal of 70% lithium recovery by 2025 demonstrates the EU's intention to attention to the problem. And the question is, is a jump from 1% to 70% in four years realistic? And this ties into what Christina was talking about. There is huge ambition in terms of the targets that are being set, but um, are they realistic? But, but, but uh, it's to, uh, in nine years, it's 2030. It's not in four right. years. It was a mistake. Apologies, I was just reading the question. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it was a mistake in the question. Right. So even so, it's it's very, very ambitious. Um, and a lot of these um, targets are very ambitious. So how do we get there? And is it possible to get there? Yes, Christina. Like you, Miko, that are, are doing recycling today, I'm nickel, cobalt and copper, etc. They say they, they can do it. And I think there are processes put in place. It's more like a question of business case. Um, I think um, still lithium is so cheap that it's not worth recycling. So we need some, some incentives to really make it. Uh, the regulation is one, of course. Yes. And do you feel that the regulations are tough enough at the moment or could more be done? The regulation is, the, is to reach 70% to 2030. That is the battery regulation. It okay. be very, very hard on the production here in Europe. Okay. Um, so in terms of um, the technologies that are being developed, I mean, there's so much going on at the moment, we'll hear this afternoon about different technologies moving away from lithium. Is there much of a challenge in terms of the science that's required to improve batteries or is it more of a legislative problem or are, are we looking at engineering or chemistry? Who needs to step up and, and help solve any problems around this lithium? David, do you have an opinion about how um, chemists can still help? Yeah, I mean, they, I think they can help a lot in, in the recycling side. I mean, there's an enormous amount to do there. And so uh, we really have to get on with that. I think Christina explained very much about the chemistry involved in the batteries and how that's being developed. So, yeah, I think chemists have a huge role to play in this. Yeah. And the, the green chemistry was mentioned earlier as well, and that's going to have a huge role, I suspect, as well, in terms of how we make batteries in the future as well. well we have to try to do that. Every, every chemistry that we do has to be green. And how do we move that from the laboratory into industry? Well, and that, that's a, a difficult thing to do, but it, it's something that we do have to do. It has to be done combining with chemical engineers who have the expertise to do the scale up of what you've developed. In the yeah. Um, another question we have here is about asking whether um, lithium batteries are the answer and um, whether or not that we should move away from working on other carbon neutral fuels rather than simply electrifying everything. Um, and this was something that occurred to me, you know, is lithium an interim technology? Is it a, a medium term answer to before we move on to hydrogen or to other fuels that perhaps we haven't developed properly yet? Um, what are your what's the panel's thoughts on that? Um, are we falsely focusing on lithium ion batteries? Should we be looking elsewhere as well? Christina. Fuels uh, is a very interesting research field. I think yeah. it's really something we should push strongly. I don't think that is the... Oh, we've lost you. Like 
efficiency is batteries for it means for automotives because efficiency for batteries in an electric motor is so so very very efficient and um, but I think it's really important I think it's more long term to come there. But I am from a country where we absolutely look at biofuels as a complement. And I think, as I said before, the whole toolbox is necessary in this transition we have in front of us. David. Yeah, I, I mean, I think lithium is the one that is sort of the low lying fruit. We can do it. We know how to do it. And, and it's there. We can use it. So it is going to be very, very important. Hydrogen will be very important as well, but it has to be green hydrogen. It has to be made by electrolysis of water. But then there are also such things as zinc air batteries. I think in Indonesia, they use these already to uh, cover up for when the grid goes down and, and they, they will run a small uh, air village, let's say, for eight hours or something like that. I, I don't know a great deal about them, but maybe Luigi knows something about zinc air batteries. Yeah, no, uh, we are also looking, it's coming back, let's say, they, they had uh, quite success uh, years ago, uh, the company you mentioned, I don't remember the name now, uh, then they filed, I think, so, uh, but the, the, the patent has been, uh, let's say, uh, okay, they, they've been bought by a company which is doing now long-term storage uh, with interesting, uh, let's say, uh, plans for having a 100 hours system. So it's something that is uh, coming back uh, in the market. The uh, issue was the, the, the niche market in that case. Huh? They, they found that niche, but it was finally a niche. Uh, concerning the, 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 the technology, if I can uh, ask also, uh, reply also to Catherine's question. Uh, hydrogen, yes, but which hydrogen? No, no we, we want green hydrogen. We want hydrogen for electrolysis, uh, but it's costly um, four times as of today, more than uh, blue or darker color uh, hydrogen. So, uh, and we speak about also carbon capture. We have seen as NL group uh, carbon capture 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. not brilliant results eh? uh, so as of today um, uh, battery storage uh, is a solution and also hydrogen uh, is really a solution for energy storage I don't think so, it's more an energy vector eh? and uh, we're working for integrating hydrogen into the process of the industries for instance, more than uh, as an energy storage of course if you think to uh, some, uh, I don't know, train for particular sectors in uh, remote uh, sites where you cannot uh, electrify, then it's a solution, uh, of course. Uh, but uh, each uh, sector it has its own uh, specificity, uh, specificity, I would say. Okay, thank you. Now, Fernando Rocha, I have a question for you here in the, in the, um, the box of questions. Um, can you tell us more about the judicial change in brine status from mineral to water to help out in in, in Chile. <clears throat> I, I hadn't seen this story myself, but there's a, a link there to a story in Chemistry World about well, changing uh, the status. Do to, you know about this? To be honest, uh, no. Uh, I never worked on, on brines. Uh, uh, I, of course, I have some uh, geological information about the typical mineralogy of, of lithium in, in brines uh, generally uh, is related with uh, uh, sulfur and uh, chlorine uh, minerals but uh, i work my focus is on on hard rock on, on pegmatites uh, we don't have brines uh, here in, in portugal or, or in foreign countries with uh, connections with my research group so uh, I prefer to not give a, a, an answer because I, it, it will be not a, a personal one. It's just uh, uh, from from third parties. Uh, what I know is more, much more easier to, to uh, extract uh, lithium from from brine minerals than from arcoc. Uh, not only because in general the uh, content is higher, lithium content is higher, but also from uh, 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 the chemical process to extract 
the, the element is also easier and more selective than from, from uh, uh, to, to hard rock. The hard rock minerals are more complex. Uh, generally, they are silicates, uh, and lithium is much more uh, uh, linked, uh, so it's, we need more energy to extract from, from these silicates than from, from sulfates, for instance. Thank you. And then there's another question, which is something I wanted to ask about, actually. Uh, which, which of the methods are least dangerous for big scale exploitation of lithium, considering that it can permanently damage the environment? And something I wanted to talk about, <clears throat> sort of more a personal level, I live here in Cornwall in the far southwest of England. And there's a small company here who is looking at extracting lithium from um from uh, uh, brines that are underneath lithium-rich granite in a very benign way, using old mine mine shafts and just sucking up hot brine from from this underneath the, mm -hmm. the rock, essentially, and then managing to extract via a light, a, um, an iron exchange process. Now, this is showing great promise, although it's small, and it would it probably wouldn't produce enough lithium for more than maybe in England, um, but. Is there so coupled with the question that we've had in the box? Are are there other kinds of solutions to getting lithium that don't just require you know really high energy mining or and then processing using acid or high temperatures? You know there are these small scale projects. Do they have a role to play? Well, co concerning uh, lithium extraction from brines, my previous answer uh, it of was course. clear. I, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, from from silicates, uh, yes, we need to uh, put forward some mitigation measures to reduce the environmental uh, risks uh, from from uh, uh, to met lithium metallurgy uh, uh, aside to mine. Uh, in this uh, is being studied, and there are already some some good solutions, and uh, like. Some colleagues said, I think it was Christina, uh, about recycling. This is also a question of the technology answers to demands. And now, the focus is much more on brines than on pegmatites, because it's easier and it's cheaper, like Christina stressed. Uh, yeah. Moving uh, uh, step by step from brine to pegmatite, uh, uh, these problems will put stress on technological advances and technology will give us good answers for that because this has been done for other uh, pegmatite uh, uh, metallurgies. So it is not a, a, a totally new uh, issue, it's just an adjustment for other uh, uh, processes concerning metallurgy. Uh, uh, and uh, a particular point that I, I want to, to stress again is uh, concerning hard rock minerals. They are mostly silicates. And some of these silicates are already uh, uh, used uh, for other metal extraction. So we have uh, uh, information and we have previous procedures that can be uh, upgraded to solve the questions uh, Catherine put forward. Okay, um, does anybody else have anything to add about sourcing lithium? No. Okay, shall we move on then? So, um, we have one question in there about the, <clears throat> the um, production of lithium and electrodes and how it produces CO2 in its process, and can that be justified? Though I've lost it now. I think because I've just answered it in writing. Oh. Uh, it was saying that um, lithium carbonate is used to make the lithium for That's batteries. Right, yes. And it re reduces, or to make the lithium oxide batteries, and that reduce, produces CO2. Um, but I, I just calculated that if you use, if you make 10 kilograms of lithium for this process, and that's actually I use lithium rather than lithium oxide, then um, you would in, indeed produce about uh, th um, 30 kilograms of carbon dioxide 
and that's the same as burning 10 litres of petrol. So in the lifetime of a car, that mm. amount is really very, very small. Yeah. And that comes back to a point that you made, Christina, doesn't it, about um, about whether, um, you know, offsetting the production of the lithium batteries is worth it over the lifetime of a car. You said it was paid back very quickly. can be used directly in the synthesis of the cathode materials. Um, it's not always done so, but it can. So that also means that it's not really making the carbon dioxide emissions in that way. So, okay. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Luigi, I wanted to talk to you about um, um, the end of life and uh, second life battery in terms of, you know, large scale storage or stationary storage. Um, is this something that needs more to be legislated for more getting uh, this because this feeds into the recycling and keeping the lithium in the circular economy? Y yes, especially second life batteries. Uh, is something that is uh, not so well addressed by norms, for instance, uh, electrical uh, uh, standards. Uh, it's something that is happening, by the way. Uh, I have a colleague of mine which is working in several uh, technical committees uh, like uh, ICEE uh, or also Senelec. Uh, there is something uh, happening, of course. Uh, the issue there is uh, who is going to certificate second life batteries, uh, because uh, as of today it's something which is uh, uh, up to the system integrator. So the people who uh, reassemble the, the batteries for stationary usage after their first life, but actually uh, should be taking account from the producer likely, no, the car makers. Uh, so there is a lack of regulation here, but uh, I can tell you that there's something that will be solved in the next uh, months, perhaps. Eh? Discussion okay. are ongoing. Interesting. Okay. It's also part of the digitalization I meant. So we need to trace everything from the, again, from the source up to the application. And the, right. the, the battery passport for resistance is a good way to address this, uh, which we are supporting a lot. Mm -hmm. So, and this goes on to something I also wanted to ask, which is about, um, how to write from the very start. So when the chemists are in the lab devising a new cathode material, how do they ensure that they're, when it becomes a part of an actual commercial battery, that it then can be easily dismantled and easily recycled? Because presumably when John Goodenough um, invented the first lithium ion battery with cobalt in it, he didn't know that this was gonna happen. So, <clears throat> you know, he probably wouldn't have looked at cobalt and he probably wouldn't have, um, you know, made it like that. So what, have, what do um, the scientists have to do now more on the fundamental side to make sure that the, um, the circular economy, that, that the lithium batteries can be used until you know, they've reached the very, very end of their life and then be dismantled and used again? David, do you have a thought on that? I think Christina has a thought. She has. Christina, her... sorry. <laughs> yes, I'm leading this large scale, long term uh, fundamental research program. Where we say that we want, we need to accelerate the way we find new materials and also processes, and with a sustainable patch on it. So we use the digitalization tools by by doing a lot of and handling all the data we have to see if we can see patterns, some patterns in it, and uh, screening the high throughput experiments with robotic systems to learn more on, on uh, what we can do. Because in every step, in the whole value chain of batteries, from the materials, from the mining even, the materials to the making of the electrodes of the battery cells, we have to play, play with all the components and the combination of the components. And we are also pushing the European Commission to see that also long-term research is needed for recycling so that we really can do what we call direct recycling, where we can reuse as much of possible of the electrodes as such, and not just break it into its components again, or have a hydrothermal method to, to sort of push it. So we try to look at each step. And in Europe, we have had a lack of 
of um, experience on m- making battery cells. That's really uh, where the um, Asian countries excel. So we are building up also long-term research on how to upscale and think upscaling and think that from the beginning. So we have to have a little bit of transition in the minds of young people that do the research in the lab to look at what what are we want to do in a sort of eco design way. So this is what we're trying to do. We can inspire the whole of Europe, I don't know, but that's our our ambition. (laughs) Um, and I wanted to ask about, um, we're talking about Europe, obviously, because this is a European society, but um, the source I lost of it, you. I had a long answer. Did I? I lost you, I think. I'm sorry. I know. I still have you. No, good. <laughs> I, I wanted to move on to talk about, because we're coming to the end of time, to talk globally, because your source of lithium at the moment is uh, not in Europe. Um You've just said, you know, the batteries themselves are generally not made in Europe. How does Europe and its ambitious recycling goals and infrastructure fit into a global scenario? How how can we, I mean, the lithium battery is not, it's not just a European concern. How do we think more globally about this? And, and how does um, the chemists in Europe work to, to ensure that this, this can be not just a European effort. Does anybody have a thought on that? Well, I'll make a comment. I mean, Europe is, seems to be one of the biggest users of lithium or likely to be in, in cars. So, uh, and we've heard that there are deposits in Portugal, but probably not enough to, to, to do the whole of Europe. So again, I think, Recycling is going to be the answer. We're going to have all these all this lithium which we've used in the cars. We have to recycle it to be able to continue and not to depend so much on imports from elsewhere. And can the recycling technology that we develop then be encouraged to be used globally? Indeed. Because I, I know that there's a huge problem with not recycling in other yeah. countries, China, for example. Indeed, I mean, in China, they are much more advanced than we are on recycling of batteries. They are ahead. Oh, really? Have to catch up. Oh, Europe geez. has to catch up. And when Europe said we want to make battery cells in Europe, they said boom, and all the Asian companies moved into Europe. Elgi mm-hmm. in Poland, Seattle, and in Germany, etc. So we are facing a whole geopolitical situation. And I'm not a politician. I'm just a scientist. But this is, of course, uh, something which is a concern. And I think the battery regulation was put up in this uh, to to actually safeguard a little bit what we have here. We have, during the Trump period, started to move ahead of US. But I think now they are catching up again with us. So it is a global collaboration, but also a global competition. Yes. Indeed, no, the, the, actually, one of the input of the regulation is to, to recycle in Europe also battery coming from uh, uh, overseas or for foreign countries. No? Uh, it is not a casualty, the, the citation, uh, explicit citation of this, uh, because uh, as Christian said, a lot of batteries are going towards uh, Asian countries, uh, China or uh, uh, Korea after the usage in Europe. So it's a double miss of money or resource and uh, not sustainable process finally, because you may imagine that the, the carbon footprint of uh, huge amounts of packs uh, uh, going around the world uh, for this process. Yep. Okay. Um, so I think, has anybody got any final comments? Because I think we've come into the end of our time. Is that right, Nicola? Yes, we are yeah. now at the end of the discussion. And uh, I thank you all very much. <clears throat> and now we have our lunch break and the discussion will continue in the afternoon. We will have more exciting talks and then another session of discussion at the end of the talks. And um, I want to highlight that we relaunched the poll that we made earlier in the morning in order to check uh, if people uh, after the discussion have changed their mind about the color of lithium. 
So we ask you to vote again, okay? So just to our curiosity to see whether this had any effect on your thoughts. So now I, I, I think we have to stop here and uh, we will uh, be back here at uh, 1.30 p.m. sharp and we look forward to continuing. So have a, have a nice break, have a nice lunch. See you later.